that, that didn't take long. So I wanna say thank you to all the, the alumnus, the members and friends of Columbus KTC for being here today. Um, really delighted to, uh, to be here talking with you today on the topic of mantra, uh, because um, I, I, I guess you, I could say this is your yearly reminder of how amazing mantra practice can be. And of course, I'm making this uh, statement about how amazing mantra practice can be. I'm making it for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, it really is amazing. But number two, in a couple of weeks, we're going to have the opportunity to chant the mantra of compassion at the community festival. And those of you who are fami familiar with ComFest know that every year we have a booth at the community festival, and it's an opportunity for us to meet new people who may not even know there's a Buddhist center downtown and uh, who hopefully could make use of our classes and our services. So um, as part of our activity at ComFest for many years, we have led a Chenrezy mantra chant on the Saturday morning of ComFest at the live art stage, which is at the far north side of Goodale Park. And uh, everyone who is here is welcome to come and sit in the audience or even join us on the stage as we chant O Mane Pei Me Hong. But of course, it would be wrong for me to invite you to chant a mantra that you never heard of <laughs> and didn't understand the meaning of. So uh, I like to give, every year I would like to give a short talk about how amazing the mantra O Mane Pei Me Hong is. And so that's, uh, so that's my topic. I'll talk for about 20 minutes about it, and then we can have a discussion, and then we'll chant. I think that way we get the maximum benefit out of the, uh, our time together today. Um, it's always good to begin with a, a, a good intention. And so we have uh, here the refuge prayer. And this refuge prayer is, uh, is just four lines long, but it offers an opportunity for us to state our belief that the Buddha is our teacher, the Dharma is our path, and the Sangha are our community. And we're all human, and we all have ups and downs in life, but these are things we can trust. The Buddha can be trusted because he's beyond this world. The rest of us are confused and messed up and in this world, so it's a little tougher for us, but we can absolutely trust the Buddha because he attained Buddhahood or awakening and told us that we all could attain the same thing ourselves. And the Buddha's not around anymore, so we have to rely on his teachings, the Dharma, as our method of practice and our guide. And then finally, the Sangha. There are two kinds of Sanghas. There's the Sangha that's sort of beyond the world, the enlightened bodhisattvas who are the masters of our tradition. And then the ordinary, unenlightened Sangha. We take refuge in the masters as our guides, but we take refuge in the Sangha as our companions. They're not our teachers necessarily, although oftentimes they can teach us more than just about anyone else because we care for them. Anyway, that being said, um, we'll recite this prayer two times in English and then once in, chant it once in Tibetan. In the Buddha, the Dharma, and the assembly most excellent, I take refuge until I reach enlightenment. By the merit of generosity and other good deeds, may I achieve enlightenment for the sake of all beings. In the Buddha, the Dharma, and the assembly most excellent, I take refuge until I reach enlightenment. By the merit of generosity and other good deeds, may I achieve enlightenment for the sake of all beings. Okay, in Tibetan. 
familiar with the idea of uh, transmission, but um, I'm going to mention it briefly here first. Um, 2,500 years ago, the Buddha attained enlightenment, and after his enlightenment, he gave teachings for 45 years. It's a long time. And after his death, his followers all got together and recited the teachings to each other as a way of keeping them fresh. And then they began to pass these teachings down to the subsequent generations in a process that we now call transmission. The Buddha's words were transmitted by one generation to the next, and then that generation to the next, and that generation to the next, in an unbroken line for 2,500 years. And the words the Buddha spoke were very powerful, and the words the Buddha spoke pointed toward how we ourselves can uncover our own inner Buddha nature. Because to me, that's sort of the good news of Buddhism, if you want to call it that, right, is that we all have a mind that has the potential to know itself, and to know itself completely, and to, uh, and to completely perfect its own compassion and its own wisdom. We have some naturally occurring wisdom, even on our worst days, <laughs> and we have some naturally occurring love and compassion, even on our worst days. And the job, uh, our job as a practitioner of the Buddhist teaching is to remember those bits of wisdom, remember those Remember that wisdom, remember that compassion, and bring it forward in our life, and emphasize that. I remember one time, uh, His Holiness the 17th Karmapa once said of this of teachers, but I think it's true of all of us, everyone is a mixture of qualities and faults. I hope that's not news. <laughs> everyone is a teacher of qualities and faults, and our job is to uh, choose uh, to have more uh, qualities than faults <laughs> and to choose to follow some uh, follow a teacher and a, a tradition that has relatively more qualities than faults and then to practice the qualities and not to practice the faults so I'd, I'd like it if life were always that easy but I take it as uh, a watchword and I take it as confidence that we do have naturally occurring love and compassion even on our worst days and that the more we emphasize that and the more we work on that and the more we bring it forward the more it will be present for us in our lives and for the lives of the people we love because let's face it right now the world is hurting right now and the world could use a dose of positivity love and wisdom like right now maybe yesterday we really need it right now. So one of the reasons that the Buddha taught the practice of mantra is because we need to have positive, virtuous things to place our mind on. I mean, even the Bible says, of whatever is good and true and so forth, think on these things. 
to borrow from another religion scripture. We have to think on these things. We have to emphasize these things. We have to do these things. And in my opinion, one of the easiest ways to do this is by recalling the names of the Buddhas. Recalling and chanting the names of the Buddhas has been a practice ever since there were Buddhas. And so every culture that has adopted Buddhism has adopted the chanting of the names of the Buddhas as a way of thinking on positive things, placing one's attention in, on positive, virtuous things. Because we all know the power that words have for us as human beings. Words have a lot of power. And in fact, um, the, most of the mantras that we have heard of in Buddhism, the Buddhist mantras, have to do with the names of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. So let's use as the example, Om Mane Peme Hong. So you can consider now, because we started with refuge and the Bodhisattva motivation, and I am intending for this to be a transmission for you, I have now given you <laughs> the uh, reading transmission for the mantra, Om Mane Peme Hong. So now, um, that's why I wanted to mention transmission at the beginning, because just hearing this mantra is a benefit and being able to kind of hold it in your heart and to work with it and learn about it is a way to study Dharma. Because who is named in this mantra? According to uh, Bokar Rinpoche, who wrote a book called Chenrezig, Lord of Love, the Bodhisattva of Love and Compassion, and that's why the book title calls him the Lord of Love, is Chenrezig or Avalokiteshvara in Sanskrit. Both of these names indicate a being who is aware of the suffering of the world. Avalokiteshvara implies, the, the word implies hearing the sounds and the cries of those who are suffering. And Chenrezig, the Tibetan name, implies continuously looking over beings and seeing their need and seeing their suffering and feeling for that and responding to that. So Chen, the first part of Chen Rezi's name, means I, the E-Y-E, -E, the I, the organ of sight. Ray and Zik mean continuously. So he is continuously looking over all sentient beings. And this comes from the stories about the Bodhisattva Chen Rezi that were told in the Buddhist sutras. In the Mahayana sutras, the story of Chen Rezi is told that he was a disciple of the Buddha Amitabha. And he took his, when he took his Bodhisattva vow, he took it in a very special way. He took it with a special aspiration. I don't know if, why he took it with a special aspiration, but he did. In fact, his master, the Buddha Amitabha, also took his bodhisattva vow with a special motivation. When Amitabha was an aspiring bodhisattva, he took the vow that upon his awakening, he would manifest a pure realm that anyone could enter, even if they were flawed which I like the idea, that sounds really good to me. And, uh, and in this pure realm, all of us can be reborn in Amitabha's presence, hear his teachings and attain enlightenment easily. So I'm keeping that idea in my mind for later. But for the purposes of this story, Chenrezig, Amitabha's disciple, also took his Bodhisattva vow with a special aspiration. He said that until this world of suffering is emptied, that, uh, the Buddha called this world of suffering samsara. And he said it, it, it kind of kept moving because of all of our ignorance, attachment, and anger. He said because of being's ignorance, because of being's attachment, and because of being's anger, we create suffering, not just for ourselves sometimes, but for others too. And that love, compassion, and wisdom can help us cope 
with the suffering of samsara. So wisdom, love, compassion can help us cope, which is why the Buddha taught love and compassion so thoroughly and so completely and so broadly. Because in this world of suffering, we need all the help we can get. So here is the Bodhisattva Chenrezig taking his Bodhisattva vow for the first time. And he's basically saying, until samsara's suffering is over, I will remain. I will stay here with all of you. And I will help you to calm your suffering. So he was uh, basically, you know, he was basically clocking in on a job that he probably won't clock out of for millennia upon millennia upon millennia. But don't worry about him. I don't think he's suffering because it's said that when a being reaches his level of enlightenment, they only appear to suffer. <laughs> it's a long story. <laughs> Apparently, they exist in a different way after enlightenment. They perceive and experience life in a different way after enlightenment. I will take their word for it. I believe in it, and I hope for it. So this is the being whose bodhisattva vow was so strong that he essentially said, I will stay behind and turn out the light when everybody has left samsara. I'll be there to turn out the light. And, uh, and so this is why he is honored as having the most love and the most compassion of any being like ever. And so this is why reciting his name is such a powerful prayer. And so you might say, but his name is Chen Rezi, and the mantra is Om Mani Pei Mei Hung. This doesn't appear to match. You're very astute. That is exactly right. But he is spoken of in the mantra symbolically. The word Om, according to Bokar Rinpoche, Om has many, 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 many meanings. But in this context, it refers to the enlightened body of a Buddha, the physical body of a Buddha. And hung, the, the, the syllable at the end, symbolizes the, uh, the enlightened mind of a Buddha. So the enlightened body and the enlightened mind of a Buddha. And so the two in between, mani and peme, which can be also pronounced Padme. So those of you who are wondering about whether it is Peime or Padme, you are both right. Padme is the Sanskrit pronunciation and Peime is the Tibetan pronunciation. And as my teacher once said, generations of Tibetans have attained enlightenment by saying Peime, I think we're covered. Anyway. So whichever of the two ways you choose to speak of this name, Mani refers to a jewel. And Padme, or Peme, refers to a lotus flower. So in Buddhist iconography, Chen Rezig is depicted as holding a jewel in his two center hands, a rosary in his outer right hand, and a lotus flower in his outer left hand when he is depicted with four arms. The jewel that he's holding is symbolic of Buddha nature, which like the wish-fulfilling jewel of legends, I mean, we grew up with some Eastern legends and some Western legends here in America, didn't we? We grew up with a magic lamp that granted wishes and you know, magic trees that grant wishes and so on. But this example is a jewel that grants wishes. And it is symbolic of our Buddha nature, which if we can realize our, our deepest Buddha nature, it will fulfill all of our virtuous wishes. So in any case, the, the name Mani, M-A-N-I, refers to jewel. And the word Padme uh, refers to lotus. And the lotus is part of his name because he is a bodhisattva. And the lotus flower is often used in iconography to symbolize the bodhisattva. 
Remember, Chenrezig was gonna stay behind and turn out the light in samsara? Samsara is a world of suffering. That's like the mud in a swamp. That's samsara, that's the mud. But the lotus flower blooms at the top of the water. And so the bodhisattva is rooted in this world but blooms above it, just as a lotus flower is rooted in mud and blooms above it. And so that's symbolic of the love and compassion of a bodhisattva. So by saying, Om Mani Pei Mei Hong, or Om Mani Padme Hong, we're calling on the name of Chenrezig and essentially saying, may I become like you. May I be like you. And so uh, this mantra has even more meaning than that because in the teachings, uh, each one of the syllables, Om Mani Pei Mei Hong, has a symbolism and a meaning. It symbolizes the overcoming of one of six mental afflictions. Now you remember at the beginning of the talk I mentioned three, ignorance, attachment, and aversion. But the Buddhist teachings get a little broader and they say if, if you wanna add and talk about the five mental afflictions, you will add pride and jealousy. So that's five now. Ignorance, attachment, aversion, pride, and jealousy. And if you talk about six, they add in miserliness or stinginess, the not wanting to share what we have. And so each of these syllables, Om Ma Ni Pe Me Hong, refers to the purification of each one of these because enlightenment is the purification of all mental affliction and the ripening of all natural Buddha qualities. Uh, earlier, uh, in the last uh, week or so, I heard um, we had a discussion, a Dharma discussion uh, on Wednesday evening and we talked about the five Buddha families with Lama Tom and Lama Adam. And we talked about how when we exhaust our mental affliction, what remains behind is a natural form of wisdom. And that these were the teachings given by the Buddha, but in most recent years have been repeated by great masters such as Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche, Tronga Rinpoche, and others. But we'll, we'll save that teaching for another day. But just the idea of knowing that when our when we abandon and exhaust our mental afflictions, what's left is a mind that shines, and it shines with wisdom, which is the, uh, which is the opposite of the confusion. And so each uh, Kempo Rinpoche, Kempo Kartha Rinpoche, the founder of this center, when he taught this mantra, he said that you can think that as you recite the syllables that you are purifying your own six mental afflictions by reciting the mantra, and that you can think that you're also reciting the mantra to purify and bless all sentient beings, to purify them of their imperfections, their six negative mental afflictions. And what's left behind after all that purification is done is Buddhahood. And so mantras in that way have been called uh, sacred words of power because by consciously bringing to mind the names of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, we consciously develop those qualities within us. And if we go even farther and begin to learn the meditation of these Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, for example, here on a regular basis, we recite the mantra of Chenrezi, Om Mani Pei Mei Hong, in the context of a longer set of prayers called a chanting text or a sadhana. And in that sadhana, we imagine first that Chenrezi is above our heads and that he then blesses us and all sentient beings in the universe and that all sentient beings are purified of their six mental uh, afflictions, and that all of the beings in the universe manifest instantly Buddhahood. And they all take the form of Chenrezig. 
and they are all now made of light and not solid inside. And in this way, by imagining that the world is populated by beings who are beings of light, we break through fixation on me and mine, that the Buddha said was the central vortex of suffering in the world, me and mine, you know. Uh, anyway, and so when we, when we overcome that me and mine and imagine the whole universe as being transformed into Chenrezig, we're doing the world a favor, even if it's just for a moment. Uh, we're we're uh, blessing the world with the possibility of becoming, becoming Buddhas. Sorry about that. Um, so that is the function of mantra practice, to resonate with our Buddha nature. I use the example of a tuning fork. If a tuning, we have two tuning forks tuned to A, technically when we strike one, it sounds A, right? Okay, so it sounds that tune, that tone, and then we even hold it close to the other one. They don't even have to touch, but the sympathetic vibration causes the other tuning fork to sound. And so this is why I think mantras work. It's my kind of, you know, it's a maybe silly example, but you get the idea. It's like that. Because we have Buddha nature, when we recite the names of the Buddhas and think of the thoughts of the Buddhas and so forth, what is, the, what is Buddha and the Buddha potential within us begins to resonate and that manifests more in our life. And these days we're also busy and there's so much going on and we have to work so hard to make a living. And we have to, you know, we have to do so much to take care of our home, our family, everything, we, all the responsibilities that we have, we have to work really hard. And wouldn't it be great if we had a practice to do, a spiritual practice that we could do, that we could do anywhere, anytime. And now that you've received the, uh, the transmission for Chenrezy Mantra, you can do it anytime. Of course, it will be more, made more powerful by other things. For example, if a person takes, uh, takes a formal refuge vow in the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha and becomes a, a formal follower of the Buddha, they can, uh, they can benefit more from receiving a transmission because they're, they've made the commitment toward Buddhahood themselves. It's more powerful. It makes all their subsequent promises and practices much more powerful because it's all heading toward Buddhahood now, formally and completely. And, the, and then you can take the Bodhisattva vow yourself at some time in the future. You don't have to take uh, Chenrezig's uh, version of the Bodhisattva vow, but you can think about it. Being, staying behind to turn out the lights in samsara. In any case, um, by reciting this mantra, you can practice compassion anytime. How many of us have walked down the street and not known what to do when we're confronted with suffering? When we see a person who, you know, a person, an unhoused person, if we see a person who is sick, if we see a person who's suffering in any way, how many of us have felt a little helpless and not knowing what to do because we don't know? But when we at least mentally recite the mantra with our, to ourselves, we're making an aspiration, may I know how to help you in the future? May I become like Chen Raisi and be able to help you in the future? And um, my teacher also said that these syllables, O Mani Pei Mei Hong, can be recited to uh, animals and insects. In fact, I had a friend who had a recording of the chanting, Om Mani Pei Mei Hong, and they played it for their pets. So their pets would hear, I know. They also put a little picture of Chen Raisi next to the pet's bowl, so that every time the cat or dog came to, to, to lap up some water, that they would see a picture of a Buddha. I mean, it's very sweet. It's, I mean, it's kind of dar a darling, you know? Uh, and, um, and so I, I have friends who are pet owners who have stories to tell about the impact that their own meditation practice and their own mantra practice have had on their pets. But uh, I wanted to at least introduce to you today the concept of mantras as sacred words of power that help us to recognize and resonate our own Buddha nature. They give us something to do when we feel helpless in the face of suffering. 
that gives us a way to think about ourselves as a person who is on the way to trying to be a Buddha. And by doing these types of practices, we can increase the virtuous thoughts we have, which hopefully will decrease our faults and increase our qualities. And, uh, and the Tibetan people have a, a powerful belief in Chenrezy because um, they have felt from the beginning that Chenrezy is like their patron and their protector. They call, sometimes they, the Tibetans will even call him the great protector and so on. And that his mantra is a great protection. And you will see it on rock faces everywhere. And I know that Lama Tom has been to Tibet. And uh, you saw, how, how big were they, the, the mantra up the side of a cliff, an entire cliff side covered by Omane Pemehong. They also would gather, um, I guess the proper word in English is Karen, you know, um, C-A-I-R-N, you know, like um, piles of stones. Yeah, piles of stones. And they would paint Omane Pemehong on individual stones and then place them because not every locality in Tibet had access to a sacred representation of the Buddha's body, speech, and mind. Not everybody had a public Buddha statue. Not everybody had a public stupa as we have here. And so they would build these cairns of, of Omane Peme Hung stones and then circumnambulate them as a way of honoring the mantra and honoring the Buddha that's within them. So there's lots to learn and lots to do. So um, I think it's probably better for me to stop before, I, before I, I add too much information, but I will say one more thing. And uh, I, I wanna just thank the artist who created this. Because this, uh, those of you who are familiar with uh, the artist, uh, the, uh, Paul Volcker, Paul Volcker and uh, so forth, he created this painting. And uh, he painted it and I treasure it and uh, I bought it from KTC a long time ago. And uh, it is um, the OM letter represents the purification of pride. It's white. The MA letter represents the purification of jealousy. And it's a green color. Now, isn't that interesting? In Buddhist iconography, that's the meaning of green. It's the overcoming and the... the the wisdom that overcomes jealousy. Ni, it is yellow, and it overcomes the uh, mental affliction of what I'll call compulsive attachment, just grasping. Pei is the, it's a light blue color, and it over, it's the overcoming of ignorance. It's the overcoming of ignorance. May is red, and it's the overcoming of the stinginess and the miserliness. And Hong is, uh, it, it's sometimes depicted as purple, sometimes it's depicted as black or blue-black. However it's depicted, it, it symbolizes the overcoming of hatred, resentment, anger, and all of its derivations. So by reciting O Mani Pei Mei Hong, we're making the aspiration to overcome our own negativity and the negativity of others. And if you um, re just really, if you feel sad about the state of the world, then doing the short practice of Chen Rizik can be very helpful to you. You can go to um, the website that my buddy Tom set up for me. Uh, it's Lama Kathy, L-A-M-A-K-A-T-H-Y dot net and download the short practice of Chen Rezi there. And it includes everything. The visualization of Chen Rezi above your head, the blessing of you and all beings, and the transformation of the entire universe into Chen Rezi and a pure realm. Because I think we need to, at least in our hearts and minds, bless this world because it's kind of messed up right now. And if, even if all we can do is bless the world a few times a week, <laughs> We're doing the best thing we can do to not add to the suffering of the world and perhaps maybe even heal a little bit of it. So um, I, I'm open to questions for a while and then at the end we'll chant Chen Rezi together. 
So I don't know if anybody has questions about mantra practice or if you've tried mantra practice yourself or if you have other questions. Would you, would you mind asking at the question microphone? Sorry about that. Yeah. Yeah, because th this way we can hear you. And yeah, it's great to see, by the way. Yeah. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's, for, it's for tall people. <laughs> I, um, I started wondering. I do, when um, I... I'm angry or something, I, I, in order to stop my brain from thinking those thoughts, I do all the money, but is that okay? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, I actually, somebody else asked me that question once and I said, he said, this one young man said to me, when I'm on the bus and people are getting on my last raw nerve, Instead of getting angry, I think, oh my name, pay me home, oh my name, pay me home. He said, is that all right? And I said, Absolutely, absolutely, because part of, you know, one, of the, one of the meanings of the word mantra, uh, one of the meanings of the word mantra is like a protection for the mind. Because when we're thinking of that, our mind is on something positive as opposed to going down the drain with something that's negative. So thank you for asking that. Yes. Yeah, if you want to ask a question, you can just come around this way and sit in one of the chairs. Many, many, many years ago, I had a friend who told me to take tobacco and put it in a pouch and put it on my turn signal in my car. And when I saw a dead animal on the road, I was to take a pinch, throw it out the window, and say, Omane pe me home. Wow. What exactly does it do for something that is deceased or yeah. uh, injured? I really appreciate this. It sounds like the practice that you received was um, a combination practice, doesn't it? It sounds like it's a combination of Native American spirituality where, uh, where uh, small pinches of tobacco are offered. Uh, they didn't know, uh, they didn't do this practice in Tibet, but I love the idea the Native American practice of making an offering on behalf of someone. Thank you. She happened to be a Native American. Okay, yeah, very good. That's a wonderful thing. And, um, and let, let me tell you what I know of it, what I know of it. Um, Kemba Kartha Rinpoche said that when we see injured animals and it's safe to approach them, because it's not always safe to approach an injured animal, uh, he said, if it's safe to approach them, you can say, Omane Pei Mei Hung, in their hearing. And by hearing it, their mind stream then is blessed by Chen Rizig, because he gave, when he took the Bodhisattva vow, he sort of made the, he made the um, aspiration that even those who hear his name, of which Mani and Pei Mei are a form of his name, would be blessed and, and helped. But then there's so that they would be, but, if, but what if that animal is not in our hearing? And what if the person who we're reciting the mantra for is not in our hearing? How does it help them? I think that's the question you're asking. And I think that the, the, the workings of prayer are a little bit mysterious, but I remember hearing the, the Buddhist teaching on interdependence interdependence, and that is that everything is connected to everything else, and so forth and so on, and that we have so many connections with sentient beings, both from the past and the, the near and far past and, and the present day, that if we make an intention and dedicate what one Buddhist nun called, we dedicate our positive potential we, we dedicate the virtue of our recitation. We dedicate that to the person who has died or the animal that has passed away. So I think that what I'd like to tell people is that if you put, if you want to address an envelope, put a stamp on it and throw it in the US mail, it might get there because there can be problems with addressing and so forth. But because beings share connections that are sort of beyond the physical world, we can dedicate positive potential to them because those prayers 
are infallibly addressed and will arrive. I mean, how many people have you ever had this experience with where, you, where you've thought about someone and they called you? Or you thought about someone and you saw them the next day and they said, oh, I was thinking about you. I, I, I have this feeling that we are connected in many special ways. And even if we are not connected to that poor, unfortunate animal at the side of the road, even if we don't have a karmic connection from the past, still dedicating positive potential to them is great. And they will benefit from it. They will benefit from it. And if nothing else, we will have been reminded of impermanence by praying for the animals at the side of the road. I think it's a great practice because we need to be reminded of impermanence and that's a great way to do that. So thank you for praying for the animals. Yes, how am I doing on time? I have to check and see. Oh, good, I'm good. Okay, well, thank you for the teaching, Lama Kathy. Um, and I, I, I'm gonna reveal a little bit about my practice, which I'm not proud of, but when I, uh, your, your talk of pets, I meditate, my pets are around, Usually I, I, I jokingly call it metaplation because the fact that I'm on the floor, they're happy with, and I struggle with, you know, so at those moments, I can't focus on my breath, I can't do my tongue len. Would the Omani Peme home be a good fallback to make best use of that time while my animals are interrupting my practice? Absolutely, yes, absolutely, you can definitely do that. Um, uh, I, I, cannot, I cannot, from a place of authority, tell you that that is absolutely the best, but I can say that it sounds really good to me because it's going to benefit them. I love metaplation. That's so great, you know, because the animals want to play, right? Right, so I would say that reciting Omane Pei Mei Hung is great. And actually also, also great is being in their presence and interacting with them simply without a story, just experiencing their presence, experiencing the feeling of the fur, being present with that moment of play. Now, is it better than meditation? Not 100% sure, but it's, it is mindful. It is mindful. And thank you, that alleviates a lot of guilt. Okay. So that <laughs> yes, because when we're attentive to that, there's a story involved, yes, so I get it, right. Thank you for that question. I think you just answered my question because when that time happens, I'm like, I just turn to then being in the moment with them, but am I being distracted? I, I do it. Or, or am I being too easily distracted? Well, but you know, I tell you what, you can, uh, here's what Kemper and Bache said to do one time. He said, when you're experiencing, he used the distraction of pain as the example. He said, when you first feel the pain, in your leg or whatever. He said, and you're meditating, and this will help you too. Yeah, okay, yeah, there you go. This will help you too. When you first feel the distraction, which in this case was pain, he said, first, tell yourself, I don't have to do anything about that, and then just go back to meditating. And then, if it comes back a second time, you could try that technique again, saying, I don't have to do anything about this. But you also could rearrange your posture at that point. So I would say the same thing would be true with your, with your pets. The first time they put that little paw on your face, you know, because I've seen cats, I had cats, I know how this works, you know, so they, they press their paw against your face like, are you real? <laughs> Can I, you know, can I get you? Uh, anyway, um, and you don't have to do anything at all. It's, it's not necessary. You don't, have to, you, you don't have to do anything at all. And then if they come back again, then yeah, you'll do something. But, and you might even try to go for two, you know, two ignoring the cats. And then, you know, so I think that that way, what Rinpoche said about it and why I feel this technique is useful is because we go a little farther than we think we can go. It helps with the guilt too. You know, it's like you go a little farther than you think you're capable of going, and then the next time you might be able to go farther. So I think that it's a, it's a gradual process and allowing yourself the gradual growth of that process is a good thing. Right. 
Thank you. Yeah, and as my therapist um, used to say to me always, be gentle with yourself. We have time for a couple more, if there are a couple more out there. Any other questions? Yeah, sure. <laughs> thank you for this. Hello, and Hi. thank you for giving us this talk. It's nice to see everybody. Uh -huh. um, so just my question, in the morning, I call it, waking up my Buddha with the Dharma bookends, as you said, and I'll do Om Mani Padme Home three times. And I feel like in the morning with it, it has more where I have intent with it because I want to benefit all sentient beings yeah. around me and throughout the day. Sometimes throughout the day, it kind of comes as just a random thought. And it'll come in my head and just repeat and repeat and repeat. And I was wondering if it has the same intent and power when it's just kind of just coming in my head like over and over again sometimes, whereas in the morning, you know, I say it it's three times yeah. and it has an intent. Do they have the same? I'm gonna say, I'm, I'm gonna say I don't know with certainty, <laughs> but what I will say is, I, I mean, I don't know the answer to that with certainty, mm -hmm. but I think it's pretty good and I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why I think it's good. It's because right now our thought processes I mean, I'm sorry, I don't know if this is news for you, and I'm sorry if it's news for you. Uh, it's pretty much me, 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 I, 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 okay, I'm sorry. It's just that's how it is, right? It's pretty, we're pretty much self, you know, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so anytime we can interrupt the flow of that, it's a good thing. Right. So what this indicates to me is that uh, the intentionality you put on it, it's actually starting a momentum of goodness in your day, yeah. and the fact that you revert to it randomly throughout the day, mm -hmm. I think it's excellent practice. Because um, the more, uh, the, again, remember, one of the meanings of the word mantra is a protection for the mind. And if we're being protected from the me, my grasping yeah. by a random <laughs> oh mani pay me home, beats the alternative. And, um, and the other thing is, if it also improves our karmic connection to Chen Rizig. And the karmic connection to Chen Rizig is, it's like a friendship. The more you tend it, the more, like a plant, you tend a friendship, the stronger it becomes, and the more it becomes present for you. And in fact, um, I was thinking about this the other day. Uh, this is slightly off subject. But uh, many of us felt the loss, intense loss of Kempo Kartha Rinpoche when he passed away in, in 2019. We intensely felt that loss. But what I noticed in the days after his passing and even in the years of his, since his passing, is that we've all pretty much stayed busy doing the things he would have us do. And I think that uh, having a random flow of Chen Rezi mantras coming up in one's mind is like that, in that it builds a default mode of love and compassion and wisdom. And, um, and this momentum of goodness can have really good impact on our internal life as well as how we act and are to others. So, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, for causing that memory to come up in my mind. Any other questions? Well, then I, th yes, uh -huh, sure. I'm gonna double dip. You're gonna double dip. It is permitted if no one else, ste if no one else steps forward, you can ask too. I broke my back on a Sunday morning, falling off a ladder Ooh. at work. And I didn't know that I broke my back. When I came to, I was on the floor. And I went to get up and I couldn't put pressure on my wrist. So I thought I had broken my wrist again. So I used my other wrist and I got up and when I did, I went, <clears throat> oh, I've hurt myself, I think I better get to the hospital. So I drove myself to the hospital thinking on the way 
that what happens if I can't make it to the hospital? Then I'll pull over to the side of the road and use my cell phone. Well, I got to the hospital, but I couldn't get out of the car. So a lady parked her car next to me. I got her to go inside and get somebody. They came out. They couldn't get me because I was more than 10 feet from the emergency room. Mm. So I had to drive to the emergency room door. The security guard parked my car. I got inside. I was in severe pain. They put me in a room, and it had been a full moon the night before, so it was crazy at the emergency room. I'm there at 7 a.m. It's change of shift. Nobody wants to know about me. Mm. So they put me on a gurney and put me in a room. And I was in such pain that all I could think of was oh money, pay me home. And I just started chanting it. I put myself to sleep. I got a visit from a llama the next day. And the first thing I said to him was, Llama, it works. I was in pain and I said, oh money, pay me home, and it worked. And he looked at me and smiled and just started laughing. Uh -huh. I also have found that as a chef, when I had to do jobs in the kitchen that I did not want to do and that I thought I would never get them finished, if I could get in a comfortable stance and just say, oh money, pay me home, oh money, pay me home, the job got done and it wasn't half as bad as I conceived that it was going to be. So thank you for thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that story. I'm sorry you went through all that, my goodness. Ooh. You know, um, it reminds me that we do have the potential to bless people every day of our lives just by thinking, oh my pay me hung, visualizing ourselves as the Chen Rezi, and so on and so forth. We have this incredible blessing at our continuous disposal. We can do it anytime, anywhere. In fact, um, I remember one llama said, you can even do it in the bathroom. There's, it's, it's okay, anywhere is good. Anytime is good, anywhere is good. And so that is available to us. And, uh, and you can use it, um, yeah, you can use it as a blessing and think about it when you're in a situation that's really uncomfortable. Just placing your mind in it, it's like you're making a connection. Um, I remember the previous Kalu Rinpoche once said that when we call upon the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, he said it's like we're, we're hitching a ride. He had, actually been, he had actually been introduced to the concept of hitchhiking, and so he was very enamored of the concept. And he said, it's like using their power to get somewhere. He says, like hitching a ride. And I thought that was good. Well, it, we're fortunate that we have a little bit of time left over. So um, I'm going to uh, teach you uh, a chant. Now, this may be a chant you're already familiar with if you've heard our webcasts of the Chenrezig Sadhana. And so I'm going to teach you two melodies for the mantra. Uh, one will be easy, the other will be different. I don't know if it will be easy for you or not. But um, we'll start with the traditional Tibetan melody for it. Um, I'll chant it a, a couple times and then you can see if you can join in. There's a little melody that goes with it. Uh, let's see if I can pick a note folks can hit. Oh, money, pay me hung. 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 Oh, money. Oh, my. 
That's a nice melody, right? And it took me a second, but I found the one that I wanted to teach you. It took me a second because I, I have a lot of melodies on my cell phone. And I'm going to play this one for myself so that I can hear it first. What it is is that um, I know a person uh, who is a kirtan singer, which means she um, performs Hindu and Buddhist chants for an audience. Uh, kirtan is the, um, the Indian practice of chanting with devotion and love. And so she, um, she t uh, developed a melody that we have been using with her permission at ComFest every year uh, since we started this. And I'm going to play it. I don't think we're going to be able to, uh, you'll, you'll be able to hear it, but I'm going to see if we can get it here. Uh, the, the woman's name is Lee Harrington. This is apparently me singing it. Oh yeah, okay, okay. Okay, yeah. That's an easy one. Okay, I think I can do that one. It's, uh, it's uh, played with a rhythm as opposed to um, being just a melody. And, um, and so if any of you are uh, interested in coming to ComFest in two Saturdays from now and chanting with me uh, on the live arts stage, we'll have cushions for you to sit on and a text for you to follow. But um, about five or ten minutes in the middle is going to just be chanting "O Mane Pe Me Hong," and uh, and so um, I wish I had a, a guitar, because it, it would make it a little easier. But um, it goes like this: "O Mane Pe Me Hong, O Mane Pe Me Hong." Oh, Oh mane pe me hong oh mane pe me hong oh Oh mane pe me hong oh mane pe me hong oh and then somebody in the background goes oh mane pe me Oh mane pe me hong oh mane pe me hong oh mane pe me hong oh mane pe hong oh mane pe me 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 hong Oh, mane pe me hong. Oh, mane pe me hong. Oh. So now you have been to our first of two Oh, oh mane pe me hong kirtan rehearsals. <laughs> um, there will be another one uh, next week. Uh, at 12.30 after the, um, after the regular Dharma talk. 
and I'll just get together, and I will be looking for a guitarist, so if you, um, if you play, I don't know the chords, someone will have to help me, but uh, you get the idea. I've got a musician in the front row, he'll, he'll tell me in a minute. So, uh, so in any case, uh, I wanna thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to talk with you today about Omane Pemehong. And, um, and you can come up afterwards if you want to, uh, I'm gonna stay here rather than leaving. So if you want to come to the, um, the Chenrezig Kirtan, it will take a half an hour of your Saturday on, uh, at 11 o'clock on the 25th, Saturday the 25th of June. And, uh, and you'll, you can show up at about a quarter to 11, and you'll probably leave at a quarter to 12. It's a very, very short setup time and takedown time, and we perform for about 20 minutes to half an hour. And we get to bless ComFest, because it gets, it gets then you know how loud the, the speakers are there. They'll hear us on the other side of the park. So we'll be able to bless everybody within a, a, a mile radius. So um, I'm really hoping to see folks come out for that and you can come and enjoy ComFest and also get some merit. So let's dedicate our merit. By the way, if you wanna come and play with the prayer wheel, you can do that too. There are several million mantras because of the beauty of technology. Microfilm is now inside, um, inside these. Well, you, wanna, you wanna borrow it now? Good, okay, go for it, clockwise. Okay, okay, you can take it to your seat and pass it around. Okay, good deal, clockwise it goes. Okay, very good. So what we'll do is we'll dedicate the goodness of this session and the goodness of, uh, of all sentient beings to the attainment of enlightenment for all beings. And we'll recite this um, once in English and once in uh, Tibetan. By this merit, may all attain omniscience, may it defeat the enemy wrongdoing, from the stormy waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death. From the ocean of samsara, may we free all beings. The courageous Manjushri, who knows everything as it is. Samantabhadra, who also knows in the same way. And all the bodhisattvas that I may follow in their path, I completely dedicate all this virtue. Oi so nam di tam che se pa ni tom ne ne pe tra nam pam che ne ke ga na chi pa lap tru pa hi si pe so le tro wa tro wa Cham pal pa wo ji tar ken pa thang Kun tu zam po te yang te shin te De da kun gi che su ta lo ching Ge wa di da tam che rap tu Thank you, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, I look forward to seeing you next time, and thank you to the sound department. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Just a quick announcement before we wrap up. We're going to do a cleaning party today, so if you could stick around, we'll have pizza, and we'll also have um, some light cleaning around the building, um, including the shrine room. So if everyone, before you leave, can stack cushions over here in the corner, and then also we're gonna stack chairs on either side uh, of the room. Um, but after that's done, meet down in the community room for a quick lunch, and then we'll, we'll get our brushes and brooms and rags and do some, some lovely cleaning and make the building sparkle. Thank you. In addition, uh, we're going to be doing a brief refuge ceremony uh, at, uh, while everybody